This is a bit of like summary of many things that we talked about before and trying to put it together. In particular, I think the new things are mainly put in domains we mentioned before, but I will talk a bit more about PFAM. A bit about work we have done on multi domain proteins, so how to stay evolved, and a bit about protein interactions. So, this is a bit of like trying to put things together that are related but not necessarily exactly the same thing. These are probably the wrong papers here. They are, but there are some other papers that are in the on the uh, in the mo Mondo. So as we said before, we have we have for instance scalp and cast to classify proteins into folds and uh, architectures and uh, and uh, groups etc. Families. However, I also said that this is actually not often proteins, there are protein domains that we classify. And a domain can be an entire protein, but it can also be a small part of protein. So this is an example of a three-domain protein that has an alpha helical bundle, orthogonal bundle, and the SH2 alpha beta sandwich domain. So these three domains are sort of uh, defined in two different ways that are often overlapping, but not always. One is that they actually are kind of independent folding units. They are kind of isolated a bit structured from the rest of the protein. They're not like, in they're mixed in between. So they're not like they are really integrated. It's like you have, you could imagine you can pull them apart from a structural point of view. And the other point of view is actually that they are found in combination with other proteins. So the SS2 domains can be found with other, many other domains. In combinations. And often these two, two definitions agree, but not always. So, in, in some cases, terms, of course, they're kind of functional things. So they have like SH2 and SH3 domains can be binding, and you can have the kinase domain then come together when it's, when it's fast. So, they are really are moving. But that's not always the case. So, in some cases, they really are different domains, but they're always arising. All the structures in the world are all next to each other. So the domain database uh, that is clearly dominant today is PFAM. So what is PFAM? Uh, so PFAM is a protein family database. So it's not based on structure directly. It's based on protein families, protein domain families. Of course, in many cases, they know the structure, they know the structure, but not always. So yeah, and so every protein is described as one or well, a zero or more PFAM domains. So here, for instance, we have this CBS domain, whatever it is, and it can be found in combination with many other fam families. This is really an evolutionary unit, so the CBS domains that are homologous to each other, so you can find them by sequence searching. But if you look at the protein, entire proteins, you find that sometimes they are together with this DH domain, sometimes they find with ABC transporters, sometimes with the cystatine beta synthetase. Uh, when we talk about PFAM, we often talk about PFAM A. It's a PFAM B database also, but PFAM A is the, uh, it's like unipot and Swiss pot, PFAM A is the well annotated part of PFAM, and PFAM B is an like automatic part of everything else. And I think nowadays PFAM B is more or less, it's very rare to actually use it. At least I, I haven't used it in a long time. We used to, but not any longer. Uh, so, what is a P from A entry? So, it, it's a description of a protein family, a protein domain family. So, you, you can imagine that if you want to create a database of this, you could take all protein sequences and align them to each other. So, you would find the protein sequence here, and then you find another sequence aligned there, and then, then then you have another one here, but it has a part over here, another one, one, one part over here. So they say, okay, this is something that is found many times. So then we define a protein domain here. And then you take the next the rest of this protein as, not, as a new search, and you keep on doing that all the time. And so the, 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 so people have done that. There was several databases that was based on this idea, like clustering all the proteins together and then finding the domains that were unique. The problem with it, there were several problems with this. One was actually that they were not really good at always finding everything. But the other one was actually they were not consistent. Like every time you did it again, you got a different answer. So if you started six months later and you had more sequences, the division is not going to be exactly the same. It's going to be different. So 
how do you solve this problem? Well, as often in biology or in biomedics, you use a manual knowledge. So you just say, okay, let's define that this is a domain, because we know that for some reason. But basically, because we do the search, we find it many times. And let's keep it like that until we have some evidence for something else. So of course, if you do, do that, and then you take what they call a seed alignment. So you take other members of the same domains, some might have this domain, some might have not have, and you define this part here as the domain. Hey, you do the same for the next domain over here, and another one over there, etc. You can also do, and you can define it in such a way that you want it to be defined all the members, to find, but not find anything else. Or, or not find anything you don't, don't want to be there. So you don't want to find another domain, so you find unknown part you want to find. So one trick to do that is actually to make the border, make it slightly too short. So you kind of throw away the borders, because most of the variation are in the border. So you have some space in between, because most of the variation happens there. But the key thing is that you have a seed alignment there. So you, this is like a small set of sequences that you actually, even manually, can curate. Can even look at the alignments. So you have a multiple sequence alignment. Like here, you have a seed alignment. And the good thing about this is that if you have this, if you if you need to change this, because of course you might have made a mistake, I mean, some things they were wrong. You finally realize that you have a lot of proteins that are a lot of domains that only match half with this. So you actually should split this domain into two halves. Because there are new sequences that really realize that this half is combined with something else in all other cases, but only half to find all. Or you find that two domains actually should, are, are related, but they, they should be very they are homologous, but they are really should be two, two, two things should be merged together. So if you make a better sequence search method, you should find both of them. But if you do that, it's not that hard to change it. I don't need to change my seed alignment. I can change it. I can divide this into two parts. And you may have to take away one domain. But everything else in the database doesn't change. So, and the good thing is that for the seed alignment, I can build the hidden marker model. Yes, there's a standard method. And I can use this hidden marker model to find all other members of this domain family. So this I can call a full alignment later. Uh, so the basis for P5 is this C alignment, but then of course you have a hidden marker model that is used built into that one C alignment. And you can also see if this if the alignment is bad, I could bet HMM and I can change it because it's really an alignment. It's not just a set of sequences, it's really an alignment. And then I can use it for searching the database. And then and nowadays there's of course a lot of description of family that uh, tells you what is there. But that's the more that's a manual annotation or a manual or actually I have a Wikipedia page for most of most of these uh, families. Not all, but many of the families. Which is a kind of good, nice collaboration with Wikipedia because they really have uh, people can add information. The people that are experts in this family can add the information. Well, so in the beginning here, it was uh, if you look at number of families and they have the coverage, now it is, as I said, I think it said yesterday, it's about 75% of the coverage of Unibrot. It's not 7,500, it's a bit old, it's, I think it's 14,000 families. But you, uh, but you see that you basically get 70% of the coverage with 3,000 families, and then it's like the, all the other families are the small ones. So really, like small set of families that are cover a lot. And, uh, but there are, so now I think it is 14,000 families. So I think the first release was only a few hundred families or something less. The paper we had on Monday is just the first version of it. And it was actually developed by Eric Sonhammer, who will give this course in comparative genomics in later this year. But it was while he was a PhD student. And now, but it's still, it's still maintained by his collaborators, in, mainly in the UK. Yes. One question. Yes. Do the names of the domains come from proteins with one single domain that they for some reason lose up in the specific? So for example, an anti binding domain is, how do you put this name? So, well, because you know that, that some members of that family binds, binds. Uh, and so it, there are, of course, domains that never are found alone, that always find a combination of something else. 
So it doesn't have to be for single band, but of course, the, for some reason, someone has done an experiment, so there's some data that shows that it is, it is binding. There are, of course, a number of domains that have no, no functional notation at all. So if you go to PFAM, So if you, you can uh, so if you go here, you know, uh, I guess I have one zero to my. So I called P found zero 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 one is the first one. So this is the PCR. So for this is rhodopsin like receptors is called. And uh, this is, of course, because rhodopsin is a protein, there's no one that like it. And then, of course, it's, I mean, it's a very extremely well studied, it's the reason why it's number one, because it was the <laughs> biggest one. And uh, therefore, it's someone, this is a typical Wikipedia page, it like, has some functional description, scope description, uh, it has subfamilies, etc., etc., etc. But you have a, a domain organization, so you basically have, is this found in together with other things, and basically, there are 26,000 sequences that, that are in big set, has, uh, this kind of has something else before, and then it has this one. But it, was, it basically only has that domain, nothing else. This, I think, is a thing, this is, right, maybe an extra memory. Then. There are a few that are combined, two of these together. I'm not sure if they, uh, from some blind cave fish. And there are some here with some repeat domains, etc. That, uh, and there are some other things, but these are like 47 examples from, some of these are probably wrong annotated. I don't know why, don't know why you should have an LDL receptor in front of this 17 receptor. Because this, this is a native matic. You guys look at alignment, if you want to view the, I mean, you can have to see the alignment, so there's only 64 sequences that defines this family. Uh, if you click there, you see how it looks like. So it's not, I mean, you see, it's, it's a quite, uh, Good, I mean, this is 64 sequences. Well, it's at least part of it is quite nice to conserve, and then there's some big gaps at the end, some probably shorter. And I think it probably is a bit short. You can make an HMM logger, so you see here you have you can see what there is conserved. You see, then you do that. Uh, So it's not, I mean, the alignment is quite long, and it's not, not so many positions are extremely well conserved. I can look at the clan level, which is like, no, it's something rather new, it's almost a few years old. old. So this is uh, clan 0912, which is the GPCR clan, so this is all the 17 receptors together. So there are 36 different families. So these are all homologous in some way or another, but they are... So if you then take, for instance, uh, we had the Rhodopsin ones we had, but you have you have 17M has two, and that's the secretive receptor family. So this is a family of 17M receptors. But if you take the methylmate family, so these are subfamilies of, of related proteins somehow. And mostly, I don't, know, I don't know how this division is. It's very much a practical division. It's very much like things that should find themselves, and nothing else. Like it's, it's not always. I mean, in this case, I guess they have the biology by but it's not always something makes sense. So for most, most cases, you don't really know that. You don't really know the biology of things. Just whatever works for finding a good practical answer is to use. So one thing that is, can be observed in this curve, and it, 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 it's in general true for basically everything we can learn from studying genome, is that there are, as, as, is that there are a few families that cover a lot. So basically, a protein, a genome co contains a lot of copies of very similar things, and then uh, many. So lot, so a few few families, or how do you ever do you define it, are found many, many times. And then there are quite many families that are found very, very few times. So you can logarithm scale. And you can basically manage, you have some big families that covers everything like that, and then you have 
you make smaller and smaller families and you have to fill it out and then you just come out logically get smaller and smaller. So then, then there's, there's that P1B is basically you take everything else that doesn't fit and try to cluster it using one of these automatic algorithms. Uh, and these are much, much lower quality. And then one major use of them is basically to find what, ne what are the new P from A families we should make. And of course, it's found in uh, many, many databases. I don't know what the copy is, but it's. And uh, you can download it. And particularly, uh, still, it's, like it's only 15,000, so it's still quite fast to search it. I mean, searching 15,000 sequences is, is much, much faster than, than searching 50 million sequences. It's actually it's some, it's a quick search like that, it takes a few minutes to search it. Okay, so I will tell you a little bit about what we did some years ago, which could be interesting from a perspective of uh, how domains exist in nature and how they evolve and so on, how multiple problems. So we started asking a question about um, how many proteins in different types of uh, in different organisms have one domain, two domains, three domains, etc. And we did this using two different, we used PFAM and we used SCOP in those days. And SCOP only covers the, the parts of a structure. There was, in those days, it was quite good coverage of everything in, in the structure, PDB. A PFAM covered everything in the structure. In the structure. So one major fact difference here was that PFAM covered many transmembrane proteins that SCOP didn't have. Now, this transmembrane structure have more, but it still is a lack of them. So you have the PFAM A and PFAM B domains here. But they always end up, often end up, with parts that are in between. And you don't know if that's one domain or what it is. And you can call, call it here. So you don't know if you only, if you only have one P from A domain and a P from the B domain, you don't know if you call it one domain, two domains, or maybe three domains because there's some space in between. So we divided things into, and the same thing you can do with, um, with Scope, but then we had our P from D, we made our own P from B domains to called um, multiple alignment sequences and all that. So we made our, you run the same algorithm to do it ourselves. So one, one definition was here, can we define a cutoff that is uh, we call domain? And we try different cutoffs, and it basically you get, if you use these methods, you get a very consistent answer if you use, I think, 100 residues. So this was one domain here, but this was two domains in that case. Then you get a good correlation between these methods, and then you get a good agreement. So basically, then you can you can have basically how, how many genes in different organisms do you have that have p fam assignment or or cat, cat assignment or scope assignment cat was this but and you basically ended up with p fam covers like seventy percent of the genes and scope covers fifty percent and that's more or less true still it's like you probably have increased a little bit but not that much well you know no, the number of genes covers it it's, it's increased but it's not it's not up to hundred percent yet. But if you do this, can assignments, we could basically say that um, uh, we ask, if you look at the rest of the level, so basically you say you basically here we have the PFAM domains, so we have, and these numbers are still rather similar, they increased a little bit, but, but the idea is similar. So we have uh, in PFAM A or in SCOP, we have maybe one third of eukaryotic genes assigned, residues assigned, so not, not, not just the genes, but also. Actually, the number of residues, the, the shortening has gone on part of it. And in uh, bacteria, it's higher. So this is E. coli, and in archaea, it was about the same. So we have a high coverage in bacteria. This, that's still true, because it's, it's the, the genes are shorter, so we, have, we can have better coverage there. And then if you use P from B also, we have another one third assigned. So with P from B, we basically have 75% or two thirds assigned that we can assign to genome. And then the rest are basically a small part here is proteins that are kind of unique or domains that are never find anything else, but there are also part, some parts are just the ends and the surrounding regions of the domains. No, this is the same thing as well. So if you do this. Uh, 
Mm. Well, I didn't have the slide. Okay, so, uh, that's, so basically, if you do that, you can, you can find that in archaea and bacteria, about two thirds of the genome, sixty percent of the genes, contain a single domain. While in eukaryotes, it's less than half. And in all the organisms, it's about twenty uh, percent that contain two domains, and then the rest are have, have three or more domains. So clearly, in the eukaryotes, and this includes yeast until humans and plants and everything else like that, we have many more multi-domain uh, proteins. So then you can ask, how, how does a multi-domain protein evolve? And to answer that question, we did a study. Where we... took pairs of proteins that had different domain architectures. So maybe we had this one, and we had a related protein that had basically the same domains, but lacked one. So we lack one domain here, or it may be another one that just have this domain here, and then it lacked these two domains. So we just compared the proteins on we found the, the closest neighbor that had a different architecture. So if this one was, and we used, we used a few different approaches to find the closest neighbors, but the results were more the same. And then we looked at what is happening. So in this case, we say, oh, we had one domain at the end timeline, or add or lose. You don't know if you added it or lost it. Assuming we had this one and got this one, we add one. If we had this one and lost it, we got this one. So an insertion or deletion of one domain at the end terminal. We also had a special definition of repeated domains, because they're kind of common. You have the same domain found many times. So maybe you had this protein. So this is domain type A, A, A. This has four, and then maybe you have at this side, maybe you have something else on the, on the side. And this one will have three A's and one B at the beginning. So the, the, we, we call this a repetition. But in this, in this case, it's a repeat change at the C term line of one domain. So then we ask first, okay, where does do we add things? Do we add things at the beginning or the end or the middle? And the result was very clear that you had the placement of the beginning and the end. So basically, all we add the domain is the beginning and the end. So the repeats are slightly different. Because there were some number of the and there seems to be more in the middle, but there are fewer of We also have exchanges. You could have, you have, you could have domain X here that was A replaced by X. But this will also occur in the end. The second question was, was do you add one domain? two domains, or three, or four? And the answer was very simple. You always add one domain. Almost always. Uh, so, in like 90 other cases, and there were a few, few, few cases you have seen there are two domains. But in general, you always. But also, in, it seems to be that it repeats you have more commonly add to more than one domain. When you see a two domain or three domain insertion, are you sure that it didn't happen stepwise? So there is no. Of course, we, of course, we didn't. I mean, there was noise, but it was also, we, we might have had one plus one and we had lost it. That's supposed to be. I mean, we, we never have seen it. It's only the closest neighbor we could find, but if, it's, if, it's an, if the intermediate state was lost, we don't know. So that's no. no we, 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 what was not a database, we don't know. So, and, but it's also, some of this is caused by. In perfect domain assignments, because of you, if you have something that's not perfectly assigned, you know, so there, are, there are other things that complicate it a little bit. But, in, but the, so, so that's I think it's probably this is this, some of this here parts here are probably caused by things like that. So you can actually do this. 
you can actually do this and assign it and even make a distance. You can make like you can actually make trees for like that. You can, you can actually do polynetic trees doing this type of thing. You can have this all have uh, put in Tarquin kinase, and you can see in a tree like like what has happened. So here you have this domain here is close to the, these are related because they all have an SH2 and a PTK domain. In this case here you have an, an insertion of two domains in front of the N terminal and here an insertion of the two domains at the C terminal. And in this compared this group here compared to this one, this one the PTK domain has been added here or lost. In this case we said it was lost there was most likely because you have it up here also. So most likely it was lost in this, this two, these two proteins. So you can really make an evolutionary change of uh, study of how the means are added lost. <coughs> and it's, as you see in this kind of examples, the, there are cases where you have a lot of changes. So really domains are not, I mean, there are really a lot of domain changes. So when you talk about, when this is the most complicated thing, we talk about homology. Do you think this protein is homologous to this one? Sure, they share a couple of domains, but a lot of domains are not the same. Or this one here, that, where it's PTK domain, they share there, an SH2 domain, but there's something else in between there, and there's an anchor in the domain, and another SH2 domain, that not this, then this domain is missing. So really, when you talk about homology, or homology, whatever you want to talk about, it's not obvious when you start talking about proteins that have different domains. But if you take this tree, at least, and you try, the good thing with the tree here is that it's one thing you can, you, can, you, can, you can do with the tree, which you cannot do with, with, with you know, only two proteins. And that is that you can actually see if you add it here, so here you lose the PTK domain because it's the, everything older than that, so also it has one. While here you gain these two domains because you don't think that the common answer to that is to have it. Because it's uh, there's more things that have do not have it, etc. So you can actually separate insertion from deletions. I don't know, perfectly, but at least to some extent. So we asked, do you think that proteins get bigger and more domains by time or get smaller? And we found that at least in the data we had, and that proteins in general had more likely to gain domains. And we can, and we, we can keep on this on different kingdoms of life. So we divided, I think I told you about sometime about um, the Luca, the last universal common ancestor. So this is, this is always a mystery. This is a, one of the evolutionary questions. What did, how did the common origin of all life on Earth, or maybe not viruses, but everything else, look like? And we know that we have three different kingdoms. We know that we have archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes. And you can have make some at least the rough estimates, so if, you, if we focus on the, on the eukaryotes, this is a couple of maybe three billion years ago, something in that order. This is an order of maybe the last eukaryotic common ancestor is in the order of one and a half billion years ago, something, or at least one billion years ago. And we know that this one, all these have mitochondria, they all have nucleus. One. Uh, so at least law, they basically look very much like eukaryotic cells. There was actually a paper uh, all, I think, two weeks ago in Nature where they discussed where does the mitochondria come from. Like, uh, there's been a big discussion here, basically, was the mitochondria from... I mean, so the idea of the mitochondria is that it is um, bacteria that will start living in another, another cell. So, I mean, that, that is, I think, most people agree on. But was it... Was it happened very early, so like, that's the key step for eukaryotes was it late. So they did, if I said it correctly, what they did was they basically looked at all the mitochondrial genes and looked at basically, and then tried to map it compared to other genes that are common between all the eukaryotes. And in their study, they say that most of the other genes are actually older, so these ones are actually, so the, 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 I, I, the argument was that the mitochondria is very, very late arriving into the eukaryotes. It's not it's just before the split of all the eukaryotic lines. 
so it's still, but it's still, it's like, at least that's one argument I haven't read any counter arguments. But it, 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 this is one of the big things. Another thing is almost what was this one like? Was it uh, more like, and how it is related? But anyway, we have some rough estimates. We have it that the animals was developed by a billion years ago, and the vertebrates maybe half a billion years ago, a few hundred million years ago, etc. And we can look at taking all these domains, so all the domains of PFAM or whatever domain they really have, and ask, are there any of these domains that are unique to any of these groups? So if there's a domain that only finds bacteria, or only in archaea, then we would assume that it, that it has been created after the split of uh, the last universal common ancestor. So like it's not, and if it's only found in mammals, it, of course it could exist ever here, but it, then it's very unlikely that it got lost in all the other cases. And then you can actually say how many new domains are created for different parts of, of the history in, in per, per million years. So if you do that, you can see there's actually a large group of eukaryotic genes so this is the numbers, so these are 97 domains that are unique to mammals in this, when we did this study. While there are 1,000 domains that are unique to bacteria, that are not found in archaea or in eukaryotes. And in archaea there are 200, so in, but of course in all of eukaryotes there are also 1,000. So basically, if you take all the domains we had here, there are like 1,000 that are unique to eukaryotes, 1,400 is common to everything, 200 unique to archaea, 1,000 bacteria. Also, this 1,000, uh, 139 are unique to yeast or to fungi, 284 to plant, to set, and, and 97 to mammals. And if you just take the same age that we had in the last group, we could have some guess here, you can see that in this region here, these numbers are bigger than in most other places. So basically, if you take, there seems to be a lot of new domains created early in the eukaryotic vertebrate like lineage. So this seems to be a part of the mention. On the other hand, we can also do the same thing with domain architectures. We can take the domains and take the architectures that are so the combinations of domains are found. Sorry, quick question. Yes. And uh, what about convergent evolution? Well, we don't believe in this in this case. We just, it's, I mean, it's these are basically p from domains, or maybe a some clans actually. So they, they, you, you, they can converge and look the same, but I don't think we should find them in a homologous search in that case. So certainly they can do the same function, right? that's absolutely converging, well, that's yes. But that it will converge to become, to have similar sequences, well, you can exclude it, but it's, 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 I think it's at least a small number of it at least. I mean there are probably many other problems that are much more severe, that we have parts we don't assign and lots of things we don't know that are unique, etc. So this is, the other problems are probably more, more, more I mean, these age estimates are very rough. They can be probably a factor too wrong, so then we'll change the numbers a lot. But um, that convergence evolution for for proteins to have sequencing that you find in this problem, at least in my mind, is very unlikely. Uh, so this is what you, if you, like, you do the same thing, but instead of looking at which domains are unique, you look at what domain architectures are unique. And what you see, so basically we have about 1,500 domain architectures, so that's combination of domains. And out of these, one third or 300 existed in the common ancestor, and 400 are unique bacteria, and 547 are, uh, this is multi domains, so we ignore all the single domains here, of course. And 547 are, are unique to eukaryotes. And you see, that here you have it then. Increase in the mammal line, at least in this data. So you have higher numbers here. So this seems to be a driving force in the evolution of animals. Maybe not particular mammals, but in general animals. Well, fish are the same, or maybe not invertebrates, but at least vertebrates. Has been the combination of domains has been a factor that's supposed to have been important for um, uh, our evolution. And one factor in this well, is actually mm, have a slide. I don't have it. Well, this one uh, is actually repeated domains that I'm talking about over here. 
very interesting to take the muscles. The muscle cells have some, some extremely long proteins, like titin is long protein. It has, I don't know, a couple of hundred domains of two types that are mixed together. And they have other domains that are very, very long. And they are not, and they think they're not found in bacteria. They are, don't think they're really found in plants either, but they're basically in, in animals. So we did that. Of course, you had to do some tricks. You had to add some uh, tricks assign this, this repeatedly to the find you do some tricks you assign more of them like that but if you do that you can see a similar trend here so this is the number of uh, repeats the fraction of all proteins that have repeats so you have repeats of means they have the same domain next to each other so you have domain A and A so if you have a repeat of length 2 it's a blue line but if you ignore the blue line we take just the purple lines uh, you have 3, 4, or, no, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 20 you can see that in bacteria and archaea, this is only 1% of the proteins that have more than two domains of the same type next to each other. While in yeast, it is actually 5, 4-5%, and in all the, other, all the animals, and also in Arabidopsis, it's almost 10%. So every 10th gene we have has at least three identical domains next to each other. So this is, this is a clear, another clear difference between the higher eukaryotes and the bacteria, and, the, and the somehow the for some reason C. elegans is actually very similar to, to yeast. I don't really know, but it's, they end up somewhere in between. So what are these? So this is another feature that is unique. For, and this is um, uh, these are multicellular organisms. There are many different cell types that should interact somehow. This is one, fact, one thing that's unique that these are not what C. elegans is. I don't know why that's low. Another thing was that these genes are, the genomes are much bigger, the genes are much longer, they are much more splice for exons. I mean, the number of multi exon genes in yeast is very small. I don't know the exact number, but it's like this is a few percentage of that. In bacteria, they don't exist, only one exon. So, this is about, there are several reasons why it could be like that. But it's clearly a big difference between bacteria and at least between multicellular organisms. And you look, if you want to look at function, function of this, so you take the repeat families, you can see that half of them are somehow involved in binding. While in uh, the other families are, uh, most of them are involved in uh, catalytic or, or, or signal transduction, so basically some kind of... Yeah. So, then, so then we start to ask, so, so basically we believe that long repeats are somehow involved in binding. So maybe just a short break, but I will talk about what we did actually to analyze how these have evolved. So I think I think we can have a 15 minutes break first. We do that.